please welcome back to the stage Kunal Sood and Patricia Jones and Michelle Goodwin. Patricia, welcome. Hi. Patricia, thank you. Hi, everyone. So we're going to speak about obesity and mental health and the intersection and how important it is in today's world. As you've seen all through the day, many, many different subjects have come into play. And Patricia, I know that this is something that's close to your heart. Mm -hmm. And Michelle, you as well. Yes. Um, I'd like to know, how did this come to be? How did obesity become such a big part of your work? Well, uh, it's personal for me. I have a four and a half year old son whose father is overweight. Um, he has, uh, his mother has already passed. She was 52 when she died. His father also passed, and he was 56 when he died. And my husband is now 56, and we have a four and a half year old. So we know that there's a genetic predisposition there and uh, issues around healthy eating. So the legacy that I need to live, leave for my son is how to make good choices and good have good eating habits. Um, so I started researching that area so that I could learn more about how children develop food taste preferences and food preferences and the development of that. In the process, it's uh, led to consulting gigs, doing, <laughs> talking to other programs and uh, about what they can do to work with kids. Well, for me, it's in part because my, my, part of my research has involved organ transplantation. Uh, and it's one of the most significant uh, global challenges that we have, organ transplantation. Tremendous need uh, for kin kidneys around the world. Uh, and there's considerable organ trafficking around the world because of it. Disproportionately, people of color in the United States and globally need these organs. Why? Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure. So many of these impacts come from health. So much of it comes from obesity. And there are secondary problems uh, and other problems that flow from that. On the back end, what's really terrible is that there's a significant organ trafficking problem around the world, including in India, because there's this great demand, and then people need to seek this supply. I think you know, what what's, was in my research, what I found alarming was that the number of, uh, the prevalence of obesity was increasing. I mean, starting from 19, about 1980, uh, obesity almost tripled in the United States. So that if you took, so that now we're talking about 30% of the American population is overweight or, or obese. We saw the same trends mirrored with children, that now 30% of our children are overweight or obese. And that trend was happening not only in the United States, uh, but also around the world, that something happened after 1980 that- Our food supply. That could be part of right? it. I mean, but it's definitely a part of it. Right? How we manufacture food, how we bring food to the table. The farming industry has changed. There used to be farmers all across the world, and now multinational corporations control the food that people eat mm -hmm. significantly. Yeah. I think that that's a part of what's going on here, that it is uh, food supply. Did I also mention that I'm a clinical psychologist, but the other thing that my husband, well, what my husband does is that he's an organic farmer. He grows soybeans that gets made into a popular, the soybeans are used in a popular soy milk that you all probably drink. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yes, so we do know that there's problems with the soil and uh, problems with how uh, big ag and what they're doing uh, to our food supply and how that's impacting, how that might be impacting our health. Unfortunately, we, don't, we haven't really done a whole lot of research on linking that to specific uh, illnesses within people or specific conditions in people. I don't know that. Or uh, what's in our food. Well, that's it too. Or you think about access to uh, opportunities to be in parks, 
south side of Chicago, it's a great example. I lived in Chicago one night coming home. It was very, very late coming home. And I felt safe coming home. And in fact, I had just come from my health club. Across town, the same Michelle, but who didn't have my socioeconomic status, would have a very different kind of reality, would feel very uncomfortable coming home late at night. Access to the health club to make sure that she could exercise, can't afford it. To go to a park, well, the parks aren't at the same level of quality as parks elsewhere. What does this mean for children? And then what does it mean in terms of local food sources within those neighborhoods where people eat out of corner grocery stores that do not sell fresh produce, but instead cold cuts and the kinds of things that people should maybe eat every once in a while, those kinds of snacks, but become a regular part of people's diets? diets. Absolutely. So one of the, we know that there are some racial disparities in uh, the prevalence of childhood obesity. Uh, black girls and Hispanic males are more likely to be obese than their counterparts in other racial groups. So if we were to take one takeaway from the both of you, one each, what would it be to fight obesity going forward in terms of global health? You want to sure. go first? Well, I'd say that one thing that we need is we need a better information in people's hands so that people actually understand better what the risks happen to be. As you all know, here in California, there was some controversy recently about labeling, right? Labeling matters. We shouldn't, in fact, have to lose the fight on finding out what is in our foods. People need to know, and when they do, many will want to make better decisions. Not all, but some will want to make better decisions when they find out that what is in their food happen to be the kinds of things that we should not even want to feed animals. Um, that's good. That's true. Patricia. I want to tell a story uh, about a, and give you a sort of a, a, my ripple of hope story. Someone earlier mentioned today about health, having, reducing the amount of unhealthy food in public spaces. One of the institutions that I'm involved with is a wonderful school called the Academy for Global Citizenship. It's located on the south side of, southwest side of Chicago, an urban neighborhood, low-income, minority neighborhood. Um, and the founder is a very young woman that I met by eight years ago when she decided, when she was telling me about her dream about this school. I was incredibly impressed with her and wondered, okay, given her background and where she came from, now what is she gonna do with kids in the hood? But I watched her grow this school and turn it into this magnificent institution. Now, it's not a school that's designed to uh, fight obesity per se, it's not about that. It's about creating a, a world-class, giving a world-class education to kids, minority kids in a low-income neighborhood. It's an incredible school. There's international baccalaureate program, there's Spanish immersion, they're starting Mandarin classes, they teach yoga at that school. I mean, it rivals the offerings of the, the, the premier elite uh, private schools, elementary schools in Chicago, but this is a public school. One component of their program, besides, and they're also green and sustainable, did I mention that? One component of their, their program is that they have a health and wellness program. So what they've done is, I don't know if you know this, but at the age of five, kids begin to, after a period of time where, when they're as toddlers, they don't want to eat a lot of different foods, but at age five, something magical happens. They start being open to novel foods. And at that point is a prime time to be able to introduce kids to a lot of different foods and have them take it on. It may take more uh, exposures to that food, about 10, ex 10 to 14 exposures to get up, to, have to develop a preference for it, but they can and they do. In this school, the kids eat tempeh, quinoa, kale, asparagus. They grow their food. They grow food in their garden and they take it home. They have relationships with the urban ag organic farmers that supply food to the school. The kids understand the, the, the relationship between food that's grown for them and then the, as, as it comes to their uh, table and to their dish. They understand what it means 
to replenish the earth and replenish the soil. So they're getting a connection to the soil. They're getting a connection to their role in the earth. Um, and it's a phenom phenomenal school. But it's more than just a program, it's not more than just a feeding program. It's about training kids about what their relationship is to the planet and to the yes. earth. And in that regard, That's they're doing an amazing job. That's Thank great you. stuff. Awesome. Thank you both. Thank, thank you, Kanal. Thank you, Kanal. All right. Well, it's been a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>